Hello and welcome. I am Anjali, your Z companion, and today we're talking about ovarian cancer. And in the studio, I'm joined by two wonderful guests. My first guest is Zainab Mirza. She is the founder of Provoke Cosmetics and also a makeup artist. And she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in October 2013, and she's here with us this evening to share her story. I'm also joined in the studio by Dr. Martin Wichventer. He is the department head for women's cancer at University College London, and he's also a consultant gynecological oncologist surgeon at University College London Hospital, and he's also joining us in the studio with Zainab. Nice to see you both here. Zainab, thank you very much for joining us. And Martin, I know you, you are happy to be called Martin by first name, Absolutely. so thank you so much. It's really good to have you here. Thank you. What an amazing journey you've had since October, and it wasn't yes. even that long ago. I know. What's been happening for you? Can you give us sort of, you know, how did it begin? Um, well, for me, you know, I'd, I'd had um, gynae pain um, or gynae-related pain for sort of the last four or five years, um, sort of in and out of hospital, you know, having had gone through um, laparoscopies, sort of, you know, scans, appointments, just sort of constantly sort of in and out, um, but, you know, never got to the bottom of, of what was going on, um, you know. One appointment, I'd get told it's um, possibly this. Then they'd say, "Oh, actually, it could be this." So you know, it was kind of just being shuffled to and fro, really, um, with regards to what the possible causes for my ever, you know, ever increasing abdomen was. You know, right. I started getting. I mean, for a long time, you know. Um, I almost looked pregnant, you know. And that's a long time. I mean, four years yeah, four to years. go without picking up what this was. Absolutely. It's incredible. Um, yeah, so, you know, sort of backwards and forwards. Um, like I said, you know, it was just sort of confused um, possible scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of, um, you know, summer of 2013, I was actually on holiday and just a, a chance appointment, really, um, you know, sort of dropped a massive bomb. Um, so, you know, that's actually where I got diagnosed. Um, initially with uh, what they called a germ cell um, teratoma. Right. Um, which and that's one of the less common forms of ovarian cancer, right? Um, well, originally it was like it was the tumour, which they said was borderline. Yeah. Um, and then, you, you know, once I had had the tumour removed, um, that's when I got confirmed, you know, um, it was confirmed that it was actually um, what they called clear cell ovarian cancer. Right. Um, so that was in October, yeah. And it was actually Martin who, who was your consultant, wasn't he? Yeah, so what happened is originally, like I said, I, I, you know, um, it sort of the journey started abroad, but then, of course, when I came back to the UK, um, I specifically asked for a referral to um, UCLH because of the work that they were doing there. Um, and yeah, you know, that's that's when I met this wonderful man. That's amazing. It's an amazing. It's amazing the way things unfold, really, on these kinds of journeys. Yes, absolutely. Martin, why is it, you know, why is it that ovarian cancer is so difficult to diagnose early? Uh, the main reason for it is that the ovary is an organ which is inside, so it's within the pelvis, mm -hmm. uh, and it only gives symptoms once it has reached a certain size, or once the tumor has spread to other organs like the bowels, the diaphragm, and other organs in, in the tummy. And that's why it's so problematic to diagnose the cancer uh, yeah. early. And I think Zainab uh, very nicely described the journey patients need to go through in order to reach the diagnosis. You know, this is not unusual. This is very, very common, and this is the major problem uh, we face with this uh, disease. Right, and what kinds of things are happening then to detect it early or you know, prevent um, such a late diagnosis? So currently we don't have a proven way of early diagnosing cancer. Mm -hmm. Currently if uh, women have symptoms, you know, unusual symptoms like bloating, mm -hmm. abdominal distension, uh, sort of symptoms mimicking, mimicking irritable bowel syndrome, right. uh, sort of urinary problems, pelvic or abdominal pain, uh, they see the GP and then they see the GP uh, does a specific blood test which is called CA125, that's just a simple blood test. And and based on the outcome of this blood test, the GP then refers uh, women to um, uh, an ultrasonography. Uh, and then an ultrasound can look at the ovaries and see whether the ovaries are enlarged or whether they are suspicious. Mm -hmm. If they are, then women are referred to a tertiary referral centre like the one we have at the University College London Hospital. Right, amazing. So Zena, when you were detected with that, what happened next? What were the next steps in your journey? I mean. <laughs> You know, to be given a cancer diagnosis, I think for anyone, it is just beyond shocking. Right. You know, I, I, 
I'd always, you know, had always known about cancer, but it was not something that anyone in my inner circle had been affected by. So I think, you know, when I when I heard the words cancer, automatically, you know, without even thinking, I just thought, that's it, death. Right. That literally what, what you know was how it was. I. I could not stop thinking about my daughter, and it was like, what, what, you know, what's going to happen to her? And, um, you know, once I'd, I mean, it, it took a good few days, you know, to just get over the shock of it. I mean, the shock in itself was just humongous. Yeah. Um, and I think as soon as I got over the shock, the, the next thing I did, and this is, you know, a week after surgery, I, I got online, um, and I then, and this is, you know, I, I, I started researching the best place that I could get looked after you know, in the UK right. with regards to ovarian cancer. Um, and that's when I discovered the Macmillan Centre and, you know, UCLH and, and, and the work that they were doing. So it was kind of shock, then, you know, autopilot, and, and you know, you, you sort of then just move into this um, sort of zone where all you want then is to, to basically get, do whatever you have to do to beat the disease, yes. you know, and that's how I embarked, you know, on, on the journey at, at UCL. So it was, yeah, it was very shocking, but thankfully for me, I suppose, you know, I, I got over the shock quite quickly. Yes. And then it was about what do I need to do now to, to turn this around? Yeah. And I suppose it's probably one of those things that you never expected to get, because it's something you probably hear about but don't really know much about. Well, absolutely. Like I said, you know, um, having a swollen, you know, having a swollen tummy, you know, feeling full, yeah. all of those things, you just think, like, I mean, I've always been told that I may have a, a gluten, um, you know, allergy right. or I'm allergic to wheat. So I always put down the bloating to that. I put down the pain to something else. So you, you almost, like, find reasons yes. in your own mind for the you know for the symptoms absolutely and then when doctors say to you oh actually it's this or it's that you think oh okay it, it's this or it's that right um so yeah you, you, you know i think the one thing that i've kind of learned is listen to your body right if because you know it best yeah you know it yeah. best yeah. absolutely and if something is abnormal for you you know if suddenly you know you've gone from being you know a particular body shape to, to having things which are completely abnormal for you, like you know, like swelling or just changes, pain. You know, pain is not normal. Yeah. You know, and we. we it's an indicator, isn't it? It, it is yes. an indicator, but yeah. you know, I think as women, especially, you know, we, we kind of we're completely on ball when it's our kids or our partners, and you know, they're in pain and, and we're on it. But when it's yourself, you kind of just think, oh, actually, it's okay. It's yeah. a, it's a we numbing pain. It, don't we? we do. It's yeah. a numbing pain in, in the background, um, and you know, now what I constantly. Um, Say to, to you know, say to women is, please listen to your body. Yeah. Listen to your body. Go to your GP, and if your GP is not understanding, you know what you're saying to, to, to you know to, to them. You, you've got to push. Absolutely. You know, you, you've absolutely got to push. And I think Martin will tell you that there are things that can be done. You know, yes. um, in in terms of when you go to your GP, um, and you, you know, you really have to. You, yeah. you really have to take those steps. Like you were saying, Martin, it's like these symptoms can mimic things like irritable bowel syndrome or like you um, even um, PMS so premenstrual syndrome mm. so it's easy to think it's going to be one of those and mm. you don't pay attention and then it persists persists until you get to a later stage and then you know you've waited far longer than you needed to now if someone does go to their GP with these symptoms what can they do to like you were saying push it so for example if they do feel that there's something more serious going on what can they do uh, I think, uh, you know, nowadays GPs know that if these symptoms arise, uh, then the real next step is to do this blood test uh, mm -hmm. or and ultrasound. You know, yeah. we have these guidelines in the UK called NICE guidelines, uh, and since 2011 we have these guidelines saying that if women present with these unusual uh, symptoms or with these sort of vague symptoms, then the next step is really to do these tests, you know. And I think yeah. uh, you've uh, really made a good point uh, in my 25 year career as a doctor I've learned that we need to listen to patients you know even if a specific test say yes there is probably nothing but if a patient still insists you know yeah. that there is some problem we really need to be alerted and you know then uh, move to the next step which you know is what I've just said and how common is ovarian cancer in the UK 
So ovarian cancer is not very common compared to breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Breast cancer, we're talking about one out of eight women developing breast cancer throughout their life, whereas ovarian cancer is about one out of 80 women developing ovarian cancer. Right. So it's uh, much less life. common. It's much less common, but also much less treatable as, as breast cancer. And because it's so difficult to diagnose in the early stages, really. That is the main problem. Yeah. The far majority of women, uh, about 85% of women, are diagnosed when the tumor has managed to go from the ovary to other organs, either in the pelvis or higher up in the abdomen, like the diaphragm, the bowels, the omentum, all different organs. You know, and this is the major problem we face with ovarian cancer. So, what's happening in terms of efforts to um, detect these, this cancer early? Are there in a, any initiatives that are going on? Anything to increase awareness of this? Yes. So we uh, run the largest clinical trial that has ever been performed in the world uh, of medicine, not only in cancer, but in the world of medicine. Uh, we have a clinical trial, which is called the UK CTOX trial, uh, which has recruited more than 200,000 women uh, in the past uh, 10 years in order to see whether ultrasound in combination with a tumor marker like C125 is able to detect this cancer very, very early when it's still a very treatable disease. And uh, when do we see the results of that trial? So that trial started in 2001 uh, and it will be finishing in 2014. So by the end of this year, we will know whether this massive effort, which was led by my colleagues, not by myself, I'm just contributing, but by sure. one of my dear, uh, two of my dear colleagues at the University College London Hospital. Uh, and we will then know whether this effort really reduces the mortality from this disease. That's um, well, so I can't this, wait to hear the results. I'm sure well, you can't wait to hear either. Absolutely. It's very, yeah. very exciting. And just to our viewers out there, if you have any questions you would like to ask Martin or Zainab about their journey or from a medical perspective, please do give us a call. And remember, it's free and the number is at the bottom of the screen. So, Zainab, you were detected. You, you know, you you got into a good hands, you got into a good team yeah. of people. What was your treatment process? Okay, so I basically went through two bouts of surgery. Um, so first was to remove the, the initial tumor, um, and then I went through um, the second stage of um, the surgery, um, which is what Martin handled, and um, you know that was what we call, um, if I'm correct, the cancer staging procedure, yeah. Okay. Um, so I basically had to go, uh, undergo a radical hysterectomy. I had my lymph nodes removed. Um, so yeah, it was quite major surgery, yeah. um, you know, that I um, went through. And, um, you know, thankfully, and, you know, I, I'm so sort of grateful that, you know, post-surgery, um, I was given brilliant news that, you know, my lymph nodes came back clear. Right. Um, so therefore, chemotherapy wasn't required. Um, so yeah, for me, it's been, you know, as, as long as the, the whole process has been, the actual treatment part of it has been pretty swift, um, you know, and I am, you know, I, I do believe I am lucky, um, you know, in the sense that chemo was the one thing that I was petrified of. Um, and the thing is, you are an exception because, you know, this is more common in postmenopausal women. So you were quite an exception to that, really. Yeah, I mean, this is it. You know, when, when you think about, you know, norm, women at what age they normally get diagnosed, yeah. it is kind of, you know, around the 50 mark, yeah. things like that. So yeah, I mean, ovarian cancer was a shock diagnosis, but I think, you know, I feel like um, I was meant to go through it, you know, for a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, it, I really do, as, as crazy as that sounds, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're handed a sentence like cancer, but then to be able to come out of it, um, you know, the way that I am now, um, you know, I really believe that I found, I, it's almost like I found a calling. Yes, you because know? you're so active now in yes, raising absolutely, awareness. Yeah. And isn't there an event on Thursday? Yes, yeah, so World, it's, it's World Ovarian Cancer Day. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So World Ovarian Cancer Day is a global initiative. Um, and the idea of that initiative is to actually raise awareness mm all over the world for ovarian cancer. And I think it's really important, I mean, I don't know whether you've, you've kind of uh, told your viewers before, but 250,000 cases every single year, and 140,000 of those women actually die. And, wow. you know, they lose their battle. So, I mean, if you look at those statistics, yeah. it's just crazy. It's, they're not yeah. very pleasant statistics, but that just emphasizes the importance of raising of, awareness. Of raising really. awareness, yes, yes getting absolutely. Getting as early as you can. Yeah. Absolutely, and, you know, there, there's brilliant work being done. I mean, the, you know, the work that is being funded by the EVA you know, absolutely. with um, UCLH, yeah. that, you know, absolutely amazing. So yeah, th there's a lot of stuff happening on the 8th of May, and you know, what I kind of embarked on was 
you know, let, let, let's do something to raise awareness, but let's make it fun. Keep it, you know, not not morbid. Yeah. Um, you know, let, inspirational. Let's, inspirational. Light. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm organising um, a beauty fundraiser. It's called Beauty Versus Cancer, nice. um, taking place in Finchley. Um, and yeah, you know, the, the idea of the day is is basically to get women to come down be pampered through beauty um, you know so we've got a beauty lounge where we'll be doing treatments all day that we've got so a, fun. a retail <laughs> lounge I I be where women can come and spend their money yeah. um, you know and give it all to us so that we can you know we, we can give it on, on to research yeah, um, so all the proceeds would be going to charity all the proceeds yeah, it is brilliant. a complete non-profit event I mean I have literally begged and begged people to come on board <laughs> you know to, to sponsor I mean our venue um, Stephen's house they've actually sponsored the venue for us so you know we've had brilliant um, people on board in terms of supporting the cause, yes. you know, and everyone's kind of understood the importance of World Ovarian Cancer Day and raising awareness yes. for ovarian cancer. So, and you know, one of the most important zones in the event is our education zone, where we'll be doing lectures, you know, on cancer awareness, um, on nutrition, on things that you know you can do to maybe not prevent, but you know, to at least help, um, you know, with picking up symptoms, things like that. So, a lot yeah. of benefit really for everyone. For to attend, everyone, even yeah. spouses and absolutely, and yes, members, absolutely. Really. We've got a kids lounge um, where we're we're going to be doing activities, cancer-related activities with the kids. Wonderful. You know, um, so yeah, you know, we're really hoping that people will come down, support the event, support the cause more yes. than the. You know, it's not the event; it's the cause, um, and actually help us. Us, um, give a voice to ovarian cancer research because I really believe that you know people like Martin and, and his colleagues need to be funded of course you know, to really progress, to, to really progress yes. you know and, and now we do sorry to stop you there's we do have a caller on the line who'd love to speak with you oh, okay hello there who's calling hello what's your name hi mine hello. hi hi what's your name my name is Naomi Watson thank you for calling what would you like to ask my, uh, my name is Naomi Watson, and... Okay. Naomi, I think you've got your TV on in the background, and if you have, you just need to turn it off so that you can hear turn me. Turn the TV off. Please, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's fine. Um, what I want to find out is we hear so much about research um, uh, for the cancer, but is there anything that we can practically do uh, so that we can take care of uh, take care of ourselves? You know, uh, what we eat, what about our lifestyle, etc. So, you know, I'm more interested in prevention. Thank um, you, Naomi. That's a really that's an excellent question. In fact, what would you say? I'll start with you, Martin. What would you say about prevention? How can we prevent ourselves even de developing these risk factors? Yes, so I think this is exactly the core of our research. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to mimic what has been achieved in cervical cancer. In cervical cancer, we understand the cause of the cancer. We know that human papilloma virus, HPV, is triggering this cancer. We're able to predict who will actually develop cervical cancer. By doing this, we can prevent cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. We have now even got a vaccine. None of this has yet been achieved in ovarian cancer. Cancer. We've only very recently found out the, that the actual cell, what your ovarian cancer comes from, is not actually on the ovary, it's coming from the fallopian tube. And we now are sort of trying to understand why ovarian cancer develops, and in parallel we try to identify new ways of, of uh, predicting who will actually develop ovarian cancer and who will not, you know. And if we are able to identify uh, women who actually develop ovarian cancer, we can then apply preventive measures like just taking the fimbrial end and leaving the ovaries untouched. Amazing. So that's the core of our research. And so what about some of the things that we could do on a day-to-day -day basis? So for example, Naomi was talking about things we could perhaps eat to reduce our risk. Um, I don't know, are, is there any exercise that we can do? Are there things that we can do to reduce the risk of developing it at all? I think a general healthy lifestyle is very, very important. You know, there's risk factors and there's factors which prevent the risk. Right. You know, I start with the preventive uh, measures, uh, which is women who have a lot of children are less likely to develop ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. Women who are on long-term oral contraceptive pill are, again, less likely to develop ovarian cancer. Ah, right. Um, okay. So, you know, these are the sort of things, but not specifically that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis sure. in order to prevent the disease. Of course. But a general uh, sort of healthy lifestyle is always very, very important. Generally looking after ourselves, absolutely. To prevent really anything coming. One in, yeah. one uh, risk factor is also obesity. So you know, keeping and watching the weight, I think, yes. is uh, very important as well. Great. Now we do have another caller on the line. Hello there. 
Hello. Hi, what's your name? Hello, I'm Suchita, calling from Finchley. Thank you so much for calling. What would you like to ask? Well, I would like to ask the doctor whether there's been an increase in ovarian cancer compared to maybe 10, 15 years ago. Sorry, can you, can you repeat that, Suchita? I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. Well, has there been an increase in ovarian cancer compared to a few years ago, maybe 15 years ago? Okay, great. Thank you for the question. Has it, did you hear that? Has there been an increase in ovarian cancer compared to, say, 10, 15 years ago? No, it's uh, more or less the same. But we are expecting an increase because women are getting bigger, you know, ah. and uh, have less likely children, you know. So we're expecting an increase uh, in the future. Great, so Chita, thank you so much for that question. So it's really, um, so obesity is quite a big factor then in increasing the risk of ovarian cancer, or, and any cancer really. It is some risk, it's not the biggest risk, but it's yes. some risk, you know. Yes, amazing. So Zainab, coming back to you and your story, so you've, you've gone through the treatment, yep. what, what then has been happening with you? How have you been coping with that process? Um, I think, you know, that there's two aspects to um, when you go through disease. You've got the physical, the medical aspect, and then you've got the emotional aspect. Mm. Um, and I think with me what's happened is I've come through the, the medical and the physical kind of process. You know, I've had all the treatment that I need thus far which, you know, is, is brilliant because, yeah. um, you, you know, I, I, right now, as of now, I don't need any further treatment, um, which That's is amazing. great. Um, Congratulations. Yeah, which, which is brilliant. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think now it's kind of um, the time to get over the, the, the emotional side of the disease because when you're going through all the medical you know, process and the journey, you don't actually have time to think about your emotional well-being, you know, and now that I've sort of come through that part, um, you know, it, it suddenly um, yeah. sort of hit me that, oh my God, I had cancer. This is what happened to me. This is what yeah. happened to me. Oh my God. I nearly, I, you know, I could have lost my life. Um, and all of those sort of factors, you know, when you start thinking about them, that's kind of what then starts, um, you know, pushing you to, to, to make you know, to make changes, and you know, it, it is lifestyle changes. I mean, I you know got diagnosed, and suddenly, I mean, I, I was quite a healthy eater before yeah. anyway, but I completely changed everything about my life. You know, just to make sure that I could help. Um, now you said on, you were ongoing. sorry. You said you were healthy. You were a healthy eater before you were diagnosed. Yeah. Did you change anything about your diet post diagnosis? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I kind, kind of, of give you a yeah, few little yeah. I mean, I started eating all the super greens, yeah. um, you know, kale, spinach, everything that you know is really good for you anyway. But you always find a reason not to eat it, you know, because it doesn't taste nice or whatever. But yeah, when you get when you get given a sentence like this, and I always say sentence because it did feel like that, yeah. you know. Um, and yeah, it is that is what made me get up and go. Uh, no, if I have to eat this every day. I will do it. Yes. You know, um, it's worth it because it's, it's your worth life. it because it's yeah. your life. And th this is it. Um, I think only when you go through something so dramatic do you actually appreciate life. Yes. Like I am so grateful for life. I mean, you know, when when Martin sort of gave me the good news, I kept sort of going, "Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> Have you, you got know? that right, Martin? <laughs> <laughs> you know, are you sure?" Not. And this is it. But you know, yes. it, it's you, you actually realize how precious life is, and you know, all the little things in life suddenly become so important, yes. um, and, and they take over all, all, all you know all the big things. And for me, it is now about doing what I can do to help other women um, and, 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 you know, help um, in some small way um, help Martin and, and his colleagues do what they do, you know, in terms of research. And it's amazing because your story is so, so inspiring. And Thank you. I wish you all the best for Beauty Versus Cancer on Thursday. I, and for all of our viewers as well, you know, if you could attend and participate and help to raise awareness of this, it would be really wonderful. Thank you to both of you for being here. I'm sorry our time has come to an end, but it's been wonderful and inspiring to hear your stories, Zainab. Thank you. And thank you so much, Martin, for your insight as well and for the amazing research that you're doing. And I'm so excited to hear the results of this clinical trial at the end of this year. So you know, looking forward to that too. Thank you both of you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you very much for joining us and to our callers for your wonderful questions. And again, if you have any more questions or would like any further information about anything we've talked about this evening, you can still email us, zcompanion at ztv.co.uk. Thank you so much for joining us. Mehu Anjali, our PC Companion.